Hello, my name is Daniel Mesa. I've been a pastor for many years. And one of the things that I have always loved is the subject of angels. But I have understood more about the angels recently, since 2015 I started studying about them, and have just been really overwhelmed by how involved angels are in the salvation of men. Now, if you're interested in the notes for this presentation, you can find those notes at revelationwithdaniel.com, the link of which will be in the description of this video. Now, I also want to say right off the bat that though angels are spirits, and the angels that we're going to be talking about today are holy angels, the angels are not the Holy Spirit. So right off the bat, at the beginning of this presentation, you have heard me say that angels are not the Holy Spirit. But angels are Holy Spirits, at least the ones that are willing to follow God's will. Now, what do I mean? You'll understand as we continue, but I'm going to show you right from the Bible that angels are called holy. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew 25, verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. A very similar thing is spoken of in Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Notice what it says. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then also another similar thing being said in Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come, in his own glory, and in the Father's glory, that is, and of the holy angels. I find it fascinating that Matthew, Mark, and Luke call the angels holy. Of course they're holy. They have chosen to follow God the entire time of their existence. They have not turned away in disobedience, and they are called holy angels. Now, I believe that there is a message that goes to the entire world. It's found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. It's called the three angels' messages. Now, these messages can be relayed in many, many different ways. But one of the things that I found fascinating after studying the subject of the angels is that right in the midst of the third angel, we find that there are some subjects involved, some people or some beings that are mentioned. Notice what it says there in Revelation 14 and verse 10. The same, which is somebody who worships the beast in his image, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, that would be God the Father, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. That would be the Father's indignation. And he, the one that worships the beast in his image, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Of course, the Lamb is Jesus Christ. But what I find so fascinating about this section of the Bible, especially the third angel's message, is that we're seeing holy angels mentioned. Now, the third angel's message is supposed to be going to the world at the very end of time. The first angel talks about the hour of God's judgment has come, and we know that we are past that point. And so, what, right now, at this time, when men are worshiping the beast and his image, instead of worshiping the Father and his image, we can see that the holy angels are mentioned, and therefore, I believe this is present truth. So, I'm very excited about it, and we'll continue on studying, and I hope you will do the same. Now, angels are not only called holy, they're also called spirits. So that's why I was saying earlier that they are holy spirits, but not the Holy Spirit. Big difference, but let's see what the Bible says here. Psalm 104 verse 4 says, God maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. So his angels are spirits, according to the Bible. Let's go and see what the book of Hebrews says in chapter 1 and 14. Of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? And so that would be quoting, of course, Psalm 104, verse 4. But notice verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits, sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? So now every one of us humans has a spirit. Your spirit may be happy or angry or fearful, but you have a spirit. And so the spirits 
that are angels, that are holy, have been given the opportunity to minister. Are they not all ministering spirits doing what? Sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Now I, having accepted Jesus Christ and hopefully yourself as well, we are heirs of salvation. And so our spirits need ministering. What better could we ask for than ministering spirits that are holy sent by God to minister to our spirits? Does that make sense? I hope so. So I believe angels, holy angels, as ministering spirits, will minister to our spirits, our individual own personal spirits. So I am thankful for that, and I believe God will continue to bless us. Notice what the Bible says in the story of the eunuch being baptized. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. Now here we're talking about the angel of the Lord speaking, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Notice verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. So in verse 26, it's the angel of the Lord. In verse 29, it's the Spirit. And then in verse 39, it's the Spirit of the Lord. Now, we've already learned that the Bible calls angels spirits. And you might say, now, wait a minute, but my Bible translation has a capital S for the word spirit in verse 29. Well, sure, that's true. It's the word pneuma. And what it doesn't do in the Greek is clarify whether it's a capital S or not. And so what we have here is the word pneuma, which is spirit. And it's mentioned as an angel of the Lord in verse 26. We know that the Bible calls angels spirits. And so that same angel of the Lord that was speaking in verse 26 was also speaking in verse 29, but here referred to as the spirit or the angel of the Lord. And so in verse 39, when it's the spirit of the Lord, you can also interchange that with the angel of the Lord. Now, do I, do I think that every single time the word angel is used, it can be transferred into spirit? Yes. Do I think every time the word spirit is used in the Bible that we could exchange it for angel? I think no. So there's a context differentiation that needs to be made. In this case, I believe it, it's applicable that we can call the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord in that section. So now, According to the writings of a dear sister that lived long ago called Ellen White, she wrote many, many, many books. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look and see what it is that she said about angels. I really respect her writings. I believe that God blessed her, called her as someone who has given a special message for us at the end of time. Now, I'm going to also show using her writings that those are consistent with the Bible. And so notice what she says in early writings, page 184 and the second paragraph. Those who lived in the days of Noah and Abraham resembled the angels in form, comeliness, and strength. Wow. So the people before the flood, they actually looked more like angels than we do? Well, that's what she said. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Now here it's talking about marrying and giving in marriage. But it does say that we will be as the angels of God in heaven. Not only in not marrying and giving in marriage, but potentially even the way we look. Why do I say that? Because doesn't Isaiah 40 verse 31 say that we shall mount up with wings as eagles? Well, yes, it does. We don't mount up today with wings as eagles unless we get into a plane, but of course they don't flap. So what I'm thinking is we're going to have wings in heaven, more like the angels than we look today. Lucifer, he closely resembled Christ. And you'll see it as it's mentioned in General Conference Daily Bulletin from 1897, paragraph 33. It says, Had not the Lord made the covering cherub, that would be Lucifer, so beautiful, so closely resembling his own image. Had not God awarded him special honor? Had anything 
been left undone in the gift of beauty and power and honor, then Satan might have had some excuse. So now look at Lucifer in the Bible. Okay, so according to Ezekiel 28 and verse 13, there are some specifics that the Bible talks about in regard to Lucifer. Notice, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz. Notice those two words, sardis and topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and gold, right? And says, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So Lucifer was created. And he was created with all these amazing jewels or gems on him. Well, notice also that the high priest had some of those same gems. It's taken from Exodus 28, verse 17. And thou shalt set in its settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be, notice, sardius and topaz. Same two stones that were mentioned in, for Lucifer in Ezekiel 28, 13. And a carbuncle. Now that word carbuncle is still in the list of what Lucifer had on him. This shall be the first row. So according to the Bible, Lucifer had the same gems that were on the high priest. They're in a different order, but you can see that they looked very similar. And we know that Jesus is the only high priest. And so according to the Bible, just like what Ellen White said, we have the angel Lucifer looking very similar or closely resembling to Jesus Christ. Notice what it says in letter 292 from 1906. All who are determined to hold fast to every feature of our faith should stand against the wiles of the devil. We are all to understand that there is a fallen angel who was once next to Christ in honor among the heavenly host. His work of deception was done in so great secrecy that the angels in less exalted positions supposed that he was the ruler of heaven. Satan made the representation that all wrong insinuations existing in heaven originated among the angels, while he himself had made suggestions which would never have been entertained by the angels had he not created them. He artfully presented these things to God as having come from the angels, while they all originated with the evil Satan himself. And so now, notice it says he was the one next to Christ in honor among the angels. We know that God the Father is the highest. The highest in power, the highest in authority, the highest in position. We know that Christ is next in authority as the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. And the one who is next in honor to Christ was Lucifer. So the first in power was the Father, the second in power was the Son, and the third in power was Lucifer. So the three highest powers in heaven were the Father, the Son, and Lucifer representing the angels. I think that's fascinating. Well now, Absalom kind of had the same idea as Lucifer did. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Samuel 15. Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of which city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, Oh, see, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. So Absalom said, moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And so just in the same way that Absalom was insinuating that he would do better than the king, Lucifer was doing the same thing in heaven, that he would be doing better than the king. So we know that the principles that were found there in the writings of Ellen White are found right in the scripture. The same kind of demonic activity uh, over the king or against the king. Now, Satan will again resemble closely the Christ, the Son of God. Notice this one's taken from the Great Controversy, page 6, 23 and 24. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, 
Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different parts of the earth. Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. That's Revelation 1, verses 13 through 15, which I won't read for the sake of time, but there's the reference that you could read if you'd like. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out in the air. Christ has come! Christ has come! The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him, which is Lucifer, while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus in the book of Acts, the multitudes, from the least to the greatest, give heed to these sorceries, saying, This is the great power of God, from Acts 8.10. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the Scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. So be not deceived, my friends. There is going to be angels, Lucifer or Satan himself specifically, who will work miracles and will perform things that will be contrary to our human abilities. Yet his words will be contrary to the Bible. This is how to know the differences between truth and error. It is always based on the Bible and the Bible only. So if you can't find it there, you won't be able to claim it as truth. So now we had talked about Lucifer being next in honor. Notice what it says in the story of redemption, the very first sentence of the book. Lucifer in heaven, before his rebellion, was a high and exalted angel, next in honor to God's dear son. Now we've already talked about the next in honor idea. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 1. It actually gives a rundown of how God gave the revelation to his son, the son gave it to an angel, the angel gave it to the prophet, and the prophet gives it to us. And so in the same way, we can see almost like a line of demarcation in power or authority, or kind of a mode of operation that goes on in heaven. Notice what it says in Revelation 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he, the one that now has the revelation, Jesus, sent and signified it by his angel. And now the angel unto his servant John. And of course, John wrote the record. You can see that in the next verse. And that's how we read about it. It goes from the father to the son to the angel to the prophet and to us. And many ways, not every way, but many ways. That's how God communicates with humanity. So Lucifer, it says, was the most beautiful angel in the heavenly courts next to Jesus Christ. But Christ was one with God, assimilated or brought to a likeness, changed into the like substance from Webster's 1828 dictionary. He was assimilated to the image of God to do the will of God. So Satan, knowing that Christ had the first place next to God, began to insinuate to the angels that he should be next to God. His great beauty and exalted position made him feel that he was not receiving due honor in being second to Christ. Therefore, he would suggest to the angels, and this suggestion began to be communicated to the heavenly angels, 
And finally, it was brought before God that Lucifer was the one who should be next to God. Thus the seed was sown, and the result was that angels sympathized with Lucifer. Next, there was war in heaven. Lucifer's beautiful appearance was constantly exalted, and the Lord God of heaven saw that Lucifer and his party were very strong against Christ. And so you can see the same idea that we just read about from letter or manuscript 90, 1910. You can see the same idea in the scripture. It's in Isaiah 14. Notice what it says. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now what's important to understand here is that Lucifer did not say, I will be the Most High. That would be the Father. What he said was, I will be like the Most High. One of the names given in the Bible to Christ is Michael. That name Michael means one like the Most High, or who is like the Most High. And so L Lucifer, before he fell, he wanted that position, the position of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Gabriel was actually given the position of Lucifer after Lucifer fell. Notice what it says there in Desire of Ages, page 99.1. The words of the angel, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God from the book of Daniel, show that he holds a position of high honor in the heavenly courts. When he came with a message to Daniel, he said, There is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, or Christ, your prince. That was Daniel 10, verse 21. Of Gabriel, the Savior speaks in the Revelation, saying that he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, which is Revelation 1, verse 1. And to John the angel declared, I am thy fellow servant with thee and with thy brethren the prophets. Revelation 22, verse 9 from the RV. Wonderful thought that the angel who stands next in honor to the Son of God is the one chosen to open the purposes of God to sinful men. So I think that's amazing. Great insight using the scriptures from the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation to show that it was Gabriel next in honor to God's dear son. And so now after the transgression, God would communicate to man only through Christ and angels. Now she says here in Signs of the Times from 1879, Christ and angels. It doesn't say Christ or angels. I've looked for that thread in her or that query in her writings and it's not found. So following is one example. Taken from Genesis 18 through 19, we can see that uh, Christ shows himself as the Lord coming with accompanying angels, the Lord here on the earth. So Christ and angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah before they were destroyed. Taken from Genesis 18, starting in verse 20, the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done it altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. Then in verse 33, the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham and Abraham returned unto his place. Chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. Verse 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his daughters, the Lord being merciful unto them. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass that when he had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So what we can see in this story, which is amazing to me, is that God had sent his son to come to look for himself at the city of Sodom before it was destroyed. Christ came with angels. So it was Christ and angels. And who was it that went and actually delivered those people from the house that was going to be destroyed in the destruction sent by God? It, were, it was angels that God had sent to actually save those people 
from destruction. I am so appreciative to God for Him sending the likes of holy angels who the Bible says excel in strength to be able to deliver me and my family and my friends. Just study Psalm 91. God will give His angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. He'll keep thee from falling lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. I love these scriptures. They're amazing to me. Have have really opened my mind to the idea of God sending angels to minister to me, not as the Holy Spirit, but as Holy Spirits. I think that's incredible. So now, according to Review and Herald from 1895, the angels hastened Lot out of Sodom, but the same warnings that came to Lot are now sounding to a world that is heedless and impenitent. To each of us the message is given, haste, escape for thy life. Better opportunities will never come. So the Bible says, now is the day of salvation. No earthly interest is worth a moment's consideration where eternal interests are involved. Christ sends his messages of love and directs the attention of men to the nobler world which they have lost from their vision. He seeks to uplift the mind of him who is absorbed in worldly enterprises and bids him to look within the gates ajar, from which the glory of God is streaming to earth. Taken from 1895. So Christ has sent his messages of love. And how did he do it according to the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah? He did it through his angels. He did it personally as well but it's Christ and angels. Now notice what Jesus said in Luke 17, verse 28 through 30. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, and they sold. They planted and they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, with angels, remember, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, the same way it was with Lot, shall it be, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So I think what we're seeing here in this verse of Revelation, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 17, is that it will be as it was in the days of Lot, right before Christ comes. What does that mean? Except that angels will be there to minister to us and bring us or help us to the point where we are saved from the destruction that is to come. I think that's amazing. Notice one more thing here. Psalm 91, verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he, that's God, shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So taken from Psalm 91, which is an end time chapter in the book of the Psalms, we can see that angels are the ones that have been given charge over us. If we don't understand the ministration of the angels, how will we be able to relate with them when they are trying to save us? I believe that God will be merciful in teaching us through his word that angels are involved in the salvation of men. Now, are we saved by angels alone? Absolutely not. There's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. But what does the Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ, do? He blesses us with the ministration of angels. So we've come to the end of part one, and I'm encouraging you to continue watching from Revelation with Daniel the messages that will keep coming out about holy angels in the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. (laughs) 